The United States is one of the wealthiest, most advanced countries in the world. Yet we're not the happiest. In a 2020 World Happiness Report study, the U.S. came in at number 18, behind mostly European countries. They used a, a detailed metric to determine uh, which country is the, the happiest in the world, but I even venture to say that our ranking of 18 might be too high. Now, you may ask why. Maybe it's political disagreements and unrest that we felt for some time. Politics has become more about winning elections and being right than it is about helping one another. Maybe it's the double-edged sword that is capitalism. Yes, we have access to lots of stuff and we, we have everything that we ever need, but at the same time, it's never enough. We want more and more and more. Whatever the reason, I think we are a people that are unsatisfied with our lives. We're constantly told how to look younger. I didn't know this, but Americans spend nearly $20 billion a year on cosmetic surgery. Now, During the last year, you, you know this, that Zillow has exploded in traffic, right? Maybe it's because we're unsatisfied with what we have. Now, self-improvement is great. I'm all for makeup if that's your thing. I don't even have a problem with cosmetic surgery, and it's perfectly fine to want to make more money and to, to move into a, a house that's better fit for your family. But when you take all that into account with what we see in the happiness report, it shows us that we are really just not satisfied with what we have. We want bigger, faster, and younger, but it always seems just a little out of reach. Why? There are things that we want that we don't have, and our brains can't seem to get enough of wanting more. In 2010, Princeton University released a study. They, they tried to figure out what, at what point were people the most happy uh, based on their salary. So at what point do people need to stop making money in order to be happy where diminishing returns would start to happen? And, and when I read those headlines 11 years ago, I thought the number would be at least six figures. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with what I've got, but I'd be a whole lot happier with $500,000 a year, right? I could try a million, a few million. I think we all could. The number wasn't that high, though. The number in 2010 dollars was $75,000. They said once a person reaches a salary of $75,000, diminishing returns start to happen, and it starts to decline in happiness. In today's dollars, that would be $89,000. Now, that sounds and it is a lot of money, but the study showed that once we've reached that mark, the money doesn't make us happy anymore. Yes, our culture pushes us to find happiness in stuff and experiences, and we get those things because they cost money. We are a rich country, but yet we're still not very happy. Why are we so unhappy? Simply put, we're not satisfied with the stuff that we already have. See, the Corinthian church, this stuff hasn't changed in 2,000 years. The Corinthian church has the same issue. Their church members weren't happy with what God had given to them and where he had placed them. And rather than thanking God for their situation and use it to spread the gospel, they were doing whatever they could to get out of it. Now this morning, I just have a few points, three main points. First, in this passage, in verse 17, we see that we are to grow where we are. In verses 18 through 20, Paul uses different views of circumcision as a way to show that people don't need to do anything before they come to Christ. And in verses 21 through 24, Paul continues that thought with the discussion of slaves and free. So the first point this morning is found in verse 17. It's grow where you are planted. Remember that those in the Corinthian church weren't very satisfied with their lives. Married people wanted out. Single people wanted in. No one was comfortable or content with where they were. They weren't content with what they had. Now, consider what happens to someone. In this church in Corinth was young Christians. They were newer believers. I mean, the church had only existed for a few decades. So consider what happens when you came to Christ. If you can think back to those, those days, some for, for us is a little longer than others, but, but if you can remember when you came to Christ, did, didn't you initially feel this 
burning zeal inside of you to make changes. I can remember as a student in, in, in middle school and in high school, um, the big thing back then in the 90s was pushing for getting rid of all of your secular music. So someone uh, at church or at, at a rally or at camp would come to know Christ and they'd go home and they'd, they'd take out their, their, their CDs that weren't praise and worship CDs and they'd break them and they'd throw them in the garbage, even the stuff that wasn't bad. I mean, they were taking Sinatra CDs and breaking, I don't know. They were consumed by this new thing in their life. Everything revolved around their new faith, and, and that's wonderful, but they couldn't understand why everybody else wasn't going 100 miles per hour like they were. See, like those new believers that I've known, the Corinthians may have been overly excited about their newfound faith. They could have been seeking to do what's right, but they just didn't know what to do. That to me seems plausible, but they could have just not been very happy with the life they had. They could have been like us where we just constantly want more and never, it's never enough. See, we could all name things that we wish we had. Things that we wish we could change. Scroll down social media, your social media feed, and you're gonna see that. Just this morning, I'm seeing people post about their renovations in their kitchen and be proud of those renovations. But if that's what gets you to get up in the morning is that you're getting new cabinets or a new countertop or you're getting a new car, we're falling in the same problems that the Corinthian church did. We must live contented lives in Christ. And though times have changed, what Paul tells us, and he tells the Corinthians, it applies to us today. He's saying that Christians must live the life that God has given to us. Whatever situation you're in, hear me on this, whatever situation you find yourself in, God is still sovereign. He is still the king. If your life situation was not part of God's plan, you would be somewhere different. Let's just say that. If God is sovereign, if you believe that he is the ruler of all creation, and that he could stop whatever's happening to you with the snap of his fingers. He could do it, right? And then we wonder, why? Why am I in this situation? Why am I suffering? Why am I in this position that I'm in? I just want out. And that's difficult. It's hard for us to do that because we don't want to suffer. We don't want to go through pain. But we must live the life that God has given to us because that's what God has called us to do. Look at verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. God places us right where we are for a purpose. Now the truth of the matter is, and I'm not sugarcoating this, but you may never see that purpose. You may never experience why God has given you what he has. You may go through your entire life and have absolutely no idea why you've suffered, why things happened the way that they did. And even with those things, God puts us right where he wants us to be. So the natural question then arises is this, well then should we seek something different? Because I can tell you this, if, if I have a headache, I'm taking medication for that. I'm not content with having a headache. If I've got something inside of me that needs to be removed, I'm going to the doctor and I'm going to have that thing taken care of. I'm not just going to be content with a disease or an illness. But you can read this passage and then you may think to yourself, well, then why should we seek anything different? If God's assigned this to us, why would someone ever want to seek change? So what do we do with missionaries then? Specifically in terms of moving on and going somewhere else, what do we do with missionaries? What do we do with church planters? Pastors who move to another church. What about you in your secular life? You get a new job, you need to relocate, you want to be closer to family. See, we see something clear that seems clear in Scripture that we need to stay where we are forever, that we need to be content with the job that we have. But we know better than that. We know that things make us move. Things call us to go to different places. So what's the difference? Can we or should we ever seek something different? Yes, but we must seek God and his calling above all else. Now this just doesn't apply to guys like me in ministry full time. This is for every single person who already belongs to Christ. Now when reading through the Bible, it's tempting to focus on what we should and should not do. Um, it gives us standards. There are standards in scripture that we're called to follow. And most of us would say right now, we don't like rules, but the truth is we do. We like expectations. When you start a new job, you want to know exactly what's expected of you. 
Some people start a new job and they want to know what the minimum they can do to still keep their job. Either way, we like those standards, but have you noticed in reading through Scripture how much of the Bible is concerned with not only what you do, but what you think? What motivates you to do what you do? It's not just our actions that matter. Why we do them matters just as much, not to the world, but to God. God sees our hearts, and he sees whether or not we're doing something for the right reasons. So the question in all of this, if you're asking yourself, what should I do? Should I get myself out of this situation and move to a different place or, or move to a different community? Or, or, or should I go to a different church? Or should I give my life on the mission field or, or serve in evangelism? Or, or what college should I go to? Or, or who should I marry? All of these questions, because they're changes. The question is, should not necessarily be the actions of it. It should be why. Should you move? Maybe. Maybe yes, maybe no. What are the motivations for your move? Are you moving to escape something? Good answer. Are you moving because of a new job? Yeah. Are you moving because you just want to live in a nicer neighborhood that you can show off your wealth? That's probably not a good answer. It depends. But what Paul is hammering home here for the church in Corinth, and remember, they weren't satisfied. They weren't satisfied in their marriage. They weren't satisfied in any aspect of their spiritual life. And what he's hammering home is that we must be at peace wherever God assigns us. Now, what I'm saying does not involve marriage, obviously. If you've committed to your spouse through a covenant marriage, you stay with your spouse for life. But for your job, your location, your neighborhood, your church, You grow where you are planted unless it is absolutely clear to you and to others that it's time to move on. Be at peace where you are and where God has called you and grow where you are planted. See, this is an inward struggle that so many of us have. We're so focused on what's coming next, aren't we? How much can we make? Where can we travel? Where our next job will be? That we fail to see the gospel opportunities right in front of us. And I think many of us have taken our eyes off of our, the immediate needs of those around us in favor of something that may or may not happen in the future. Think about it. At your work, at your job, you're unhappy. You know that you can go somewhere else and make a little bit more money, but you're just waiting for that time to happen. And, and, and you're miserable and it consumes you and all you're thinking about is what's next Do you honestly think you're in the right mind to pay attention to those around you that are suffering? Those who are hurt. Those who need to hear the the truth that God can forgive them of their sins and give them a new life. See, when we're so focused on our situation and and our life and, and the situation that we find ourselves in, we often will ignore what's going on around us, the opportunities that God has brought us And he's handing us situations to say, speak truth to these people. But if we're so focused on what comes next, we're not going to see those things. You'll miss opportunities for gospel work right in front of you. God has placed you where you are with the job you have and the neighborhood you're in and with the family that surrounds you so you can be a minister of the gospel right where you are. And Paul's words to the church in Corinth are words uh, that we need to hear right now. Are you looking for opportunities to share the gospel with those around you who are hurting? Do you ask God every day to provide you with chances for evangelism? Do you seek ways to be content where you are? See, the Corinthian church, they were falling back into spiritual infancy, making all sorts of bad decisions because they were so focused on what they didn't have that they failed to realize that there were opportunities for them right there. So in verses 18 through 20, Paul moves on, and he's supporting his argument with the example of circumcision. So in Genesis 17, God gave Abraham and those who came after him the mark of circumcision as a reminder, a physical reminder, that they were now separated or cut out from the world. They were made different. They were to be set apart. Think of circumcision as kind of a brand um, of what ranchers do with their cattle, they, they can brand their, their cow or their bull, and they could say, this belongs to me. And this is what circumcision did. Circumcision was a way for people to be seen as belonging to the Lord. Every male that was circumcised was branded by God. 
Now, this may be lost on us because we don't think this way. This is an ancient practice. Their behaviors and customs and rituals of the ancient Jews were strange to us. But circumcision was no mere medical procedure like it is today. It was a mark that one belonged to God. In Jeremiah 4, the prophet says this, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. While the sign of circumcision was a sign to the world that they belonged to God, this did not guarantee that they would actually belong to God, that they would follow the Lord. This is why Jeremiah tells people to circumcise their hearts, meaning set apart your desires, set apart your heart from the world. And in the Corinthian church, the men who were not circumcised, wanted to become circumcised. And those who were circumcised, some were attempting to put the flesh back on. See, in the Roman world, the world that Paul was writing into, circumcision was seen as an embarrassment. It was a Jewish thing. Even athletes who were uh, running in races, they would often race and run in the nude. And, and, And some of these athletes were embarrassed at what they looked like, so they were saying, well, we need to put it back on. Ancient historian Josephus writes in the Greek, theology, or Greek society, some men would try to make themselves look like they had never been circumcised. In fact, there were some who through surgery had it restored. The Corinthians, again, were not satisfied with their situation. Paul says that a man should not automatically try to seek to change his condition. He's repeating what he said in verse 17. And regarding circumcision, Paul says that forcing Gentile converts to be circumcised should not be happening. And those who've already been circumcised should not seek to go back to the way they were. Be content with where you are. So whether the person is circumcised or not, the person should remain as they are. What matters more though, then an outward expression, and that's what it is, is an inward change. It would only take a good actor or someone who is consistent at fooling people to make people think that they have things together. But we know that being a good person is not so much dependent on your actions, but rather your heart. We look at the outward appearance, the good works, the kindness, the self-sacrifice, but God looks at the heart. You can imagine a brick building that you know has been through a fire. The building blew out the, or the fire blew out the windows and it blew the roof out and, and the doors are gone. And, and so someone comes and buys the building. It's still brick frame is still up and he puts a new roof on and he, he puts new windows in and new doors and he paints over the brick and it looks like a brand new building. But the, the second that you open that front door and you take a step into the building, you see something. You see nothing but ash. And you could smell the burned wood. The owner replaced all of those things. He made it look nice on the outside, but it did nothing to make the building useful. From the outside, it looked new. It is no better, though, than an empty parking lot. It's useless. And the Christian faith says that inward change happens first, and then the outward reality happens. A changed heart leads to changed lives. And the message of the gospel is that, that through the sacrifice of Jesus, our hearts can be made new and our lives can be changed forever. And this is what Paul is focusing on the Corinthians. These people have focused so much on things that don't really matter. It doesn't matter what you look like. He'll he'll say in a minute about slaves and free. It doesn't matter whether you're a slave or you're free. Not to God. It doesn't matter whether you're married or single Jew or Gentile, child or adult, black, white, whatever you want to say, it doesn't matter. Because we all stand guilty before God and through Christ, we can all stand as his brothers and sisters, children of God. And this is what Paul is focusing on here. They fail to remember this truth. They fail to remember the gospel. The truth of the matter is circumcision to us um, is not really a topic of discussion. It probably shouldn't be. Um, I don't bring it up unless it's in Scripture. But in this book already, Paul says that that means nothing. One's marital status means nothing. And so if all we're doing is seeking to change what we already have, we're missing out on the blessings that God has given to us. Be content with where you are. Then Paul continues his arguments in verses 21 and 20 through 24 by using slavery as an illustration. Look at these verses again. Were you a bondservant when called? And bondservant is doulos in Greek. It, it, bondservant, slave, it, it has multiple connotations to it. 
Do not be concerned about it, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when, when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Paul knew that slavery wasn't the ideal condition for any of us. But if one's freedom in this life is what matters most, then they're missing the point. They're focused on the wrong things. And while we must be careful not to downplay the history of slavery and the hideous nature of slavery in our nation, there, there, there were differences in the biblical understanding, certainly. But neither was good. Buying and selling humans like they were animals was never a good thing. Chattel slavery has always been sinful and immoral. And in the ancient world, even though it had multiple connotations, but the main idea behind that was that when you are a slave, you are in essence owned by someone else. Everything that that person wanted in your life is what you had to do. And it's not an accident that in Scripture we see that we are called slaves or bondservants to Christ. It's the best way to describe what we do. Probably not the most politically correct terminology today, but it's true. It is what we are. We are tied to Christ, and whatever he wants is what we give to him. We serve him. Our allegiance belongs to him. And Paul understands that this is not ideal, slavery. He says in verse 21 that if someone can gain their freedom physically, they ought to do it. But one cannot be so consumed with what happens next that he fails to see the immediate need of those that God has placed him around. The slave who became a Christian should not feel that they were required to change their social status. And we can see why a slave would want to do this. Imagine this, in the ancient church, there were freed people and slaves that would go and worship the Lord together. They were part of the same church. Philemon talks about this in the book of Philemon. We, we, we know this, right? We know that there were slaves and freed people worshiping together. Now, what happens if a, a slave were to come into the congregation and hear the gospel, see these freed people, and think, well, to come to Christ, I've got to be freed first. And Paul says, no. No, you don't need to become free first. Your freedom is found in Christ. Yes, seek your freedom physically, but if you need, you, you need to understand that your freedom has already been purchased. Paul isn't advocating ignoring abuse, but rather than that, he's saying in Christ there is no difference between slave and free or Jew and Gentile. Now, I think that there are so many applications that we can have from this passage. So many, but there are four that really jump out of the page to me. First one, be content to serve wherever God places you. The, the truth of the matter is that most people don't like their jobs. Most people don't like where they live. Most people don't like their life situation. They wish that they could have something better. Wanting something better is a national pastime for us. And it shows in how many people are dissatisfied with what they have. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, man, uh, my job is awful, and I just wish that I could have something better. This can't be our story, though. Think about this. What does it claim, what does it say to the world when we make a statement that God is good, but then we complain, well, if he only gave me a little more, I'd be happy. It says that we really don't believe what we claim. Now, I want to share this with you, too. Where God places you may make you unhappy. Where God calls you, whatever he calls you to do may not be comfortable. It may be painful. I, I know of people who are called to go serve on a foreign mission field in war-torn countries that are ravaged by civil wars. And the chance of them dying on the mission field is high. They know that when they say goodbye to their families, their moms, their dads, their brothers and sisters, and when they take their, their spouses and their children and they go plant themselves in a foreign country that's, that's dangerous, that they know that may be the last time they ever see their loved ones. And yet they go. You may die where God sends you. I hear stories about people falling in love with cities and so they go plant a church or they go become a missionary and that's not the biblical standard. You don't have to love any place. You don't have to love a city to go serve the Lord faithfully there. Our comfort is also not in Scripture. Find our comfort in Christ. Taking one's family far away from everything they've known is not comfortable to anyone. 
God calls us to go into all the world. How will people hear without someone preaching the gospel to them? So people give up their lives and they go serve the Lord in obscurity in some faraway country. And this applies to church life too. We could, I don't encourage this, but we could all write a list of things that we would like to change in this church. Some don't like the preaching. It's too long. He yells too much. We should tell more stories, right? Some, some don't like that. Some don't like the music. Others don't like the times of t- the, 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 that we don't change our times more often or that we have 1030 worship instead of 930. See, all of us have something that we would say, yeah, we, if we were in charge, we would make a change. With as many people that we have in our church, it's impossible to avoid that. But every church and every pastor and every elder deals with those who are very quick to leave over preferences. Yes, you can find a church that plays exactly the type of music that you like. Yes, you can find a church that finishes service enough time for you to go beat the lunch crowd at Shoney's, right? Some of you are amen in that one right now. Finish. Yes, you can find a church that has hundreds and hundreds of ministries to choose from. But the truth of the matter is that the American church has become defined by its consumerism, not the gospel. Don't like your church? Come to ours. Unsatisfied with the music or preaching over there? Well, there's plenty to choose from over here. It's gotten to a point where many churches are forced with the reality, to face the reality that a family that comes to their church may have kids that go to this youth group at another church, children's ministry at one church, service at one, and Bible study at another. This is consumerism, not Christianity. Pastor Corey wrote an incredible blog post this week, and I encourage you to read this, and I want, I want to quote what he wrote. Consumerism is not the gospel. Consumerism is not the church. The church does not look to self but to Christ. In consumerism, we become consumed with personal preferences over what God says is good. We become consumed with what we want rather than what unity, the unity that God wants. We devote ourselves to opinions rather than truth. We build houses for ourselves with little to no regard for the building of the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul would say that choosing a church to, whether to stay or to leave based on personal preferences is wrong. God calls us to stay where we are and grow there even if it's uncomfortable or we don't like it. Why? Because the local church exists not to give you what you want, but rather to give God glory through worship and through service. Maybe I'm just overlooking something, but I cannot find any instance in Scripture, not one, that says our preferences matter in regards to the local church. Not one. In fact, I find the opposite. I see commands to love one another, submit to one another, honor one another. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. The truth of the matter is that if we're honoring our brothers' and sisters' preferences, it just won't matter. If you want to seek to bless others and honor them, you will sing loud even if you don't like the song. And the truth of the matter is, we have a song or two that aren't my favorite but I sing loud, at least I try. Don't sit around me though. If the preaching is faithful to the word of God, it won't matter whether it stylistically resonates with you because you know that someone else is being blessed. But the state of the American church is that if you don't like something at one church, you can find somewhere else to go. It's the consumerism that's destroying churches from the inside, it's literally tearing churches apart. And it's leaving young Christians with no one left to disciple them. The second application may sound strange, but this calling is not absolute. Now, I know what I just said. I just spent time saying how important it is to stay where you're planted, but it's not absolute. There are times when God calls us away. I think of someone moving out of the area as a good reason. So is someone who leaves to become a missionary See, I want to see FBA plant churches, lots and lots of churches, and that would ultimately mean that people who are part of our church will end up leaving our church to go start new ones. And there are biblically supported reasons for leaving a church, but I think they're a whole lot less than most people consider. 
Paul tells the Corinthians that the ideal thing is for them to stay and to grow, not be focused on what they don't have, that the other church has this better, or another ministry has this, or another church family has this, but rather stay where you're planted and grow there. Not to be focused on what you don't have, but rather blossom in the ministry that you're currently in. The third application is this. You can and should speak against oppression and brutality that undermines the truth that we are image bearers. But that means nothing if we're spiritually dead. What I mean is that things happen in the world that are a result of politics and corruption. And the church should speak truth into those situations. Be salt and light in the world. We should be seeking ways to apply the gospel to the world that we see. You see something happening, you answer that from a gospel perspective. You say, well, what do you mean? We're not okay with abortion and we're not okay with child trafficking. Why? Well, it's not nice. No, that's not the reason. The reason is that gospel tells us that we are all created in the image of God and every person has dignity and worth because they're image bearers. They, they bear that mark that no other aspect of creation carries. So we care for one another. We love one another. They're sacred. Every life is sacred. If slavery still existed in our country, I hope we'd all stand up and say that it's evil and it must be stopped. We could fight against it because the gospel teaches us that every person is worthy of dignity and respect. So Paul is saying that a slave, doesn't, uh, that a slave should be content. It doesn't mean that the slave should not aim to gain his freedom or that even we should be silent. Paul's saying be content with where you are because God's placed you there. But yes, you can seek to change those. It's not absolute. If you're in a position where you can move up in a company, move up in the company. If you're in a position where you're, you're in some kind of bondage, of course you want to be out of that bondage. But the truth of the matter is that for wherever we're placed, God has a purpose and a plan for us being there. And I'll apply this to, to what I know a lot of people in our church are going through right now. Right now you may be suffering physically. You may have some physical ailment that you just don't understand why you have it. Physical, you struggle, uh, the doctors can't figure it out, or you're on some kind of treatment plan or medicine. Uh, maybe you've even been told that it's very serious and maybe even told that it's terminal. And in your mind, you're trying to figure out why would God allow me to have this? Why would God allow me to suffer? I'm his child. Doesn't he want the best for me? I guess it's how you define the word best. As you're sitting in the hospital and as you're receiving those medications, as you're in pain, do you know who's watching you? Those doctors? Those nurses? Maybe God's placed you in that position so that you can be a witness for him. Maybe God's put you in a position where you're, you're suffering or you're in pain or you're dealing with some kind of struggles in your family so that you can be the salt and light that your family so desperately needs. The fourth application is this. In all things, seek the contentment that only God can give. As long as you are somewhere, you're exactly where you need to be. Now, these points apply to Christians. If you're not a Christian, the Bible says that you should not be content with where you are. You, you, you should be discontented. You should be uncomfortable with what I'm saying. You should be uncomfortable with your life. I hope you see one thing clearly, though. What you believe and what motivates you matters just as much as what you do. You could be the world's nicest person and you could still go to hell. You can give all the money and help all the people that you encounter, but you will not be able to purchase what you need most. Every Christian has come to realize that they cannot do enough to please God. It is only when we realize that and we see how sinful and dark our hearts really are that we can come to Christ in repentance and faith. If you're not a Christian, I pray that you consider whether you've been resting on your own goodness, your own good works, your own strength, or if you say, no, I'm not good enough, but Jesus Christ is. For the Christian, this passage tells us that our contentment cannot be found in anything but Christ. When we look to our circumstances, our job, our family, our church, we will be left with something less than what God has promised to us. When we rest in the promises of God, we find that those things that I just mentioned have no power over us. Yes, they matter, but you see them for what they really are. Not a means of contentment, a means of growth, but not a means of contentment. 
The truth is, in all of this, is find your contentment in Christ. When we seek and search and cling to stuff that's not Christ, and we try to find our contentment in things that are not of Christ, we're left without hope. Cling to Christ, the only one who can provide you with true contentment. Would you pray with me?